I'm not going to stay in Zechariah very long, but I wanted to use this text. Um, Who hath despised the day of small things? And probably if I were to superimpose on that a New Testament saying of our Lord who described the kingdom of heaven as a grain of mustard seed, that when it has taken root, grows to be great, and even the fowls of the air come to take rest and abide in it. The book of Zechariah helps me a little bit to set and give a contextual footing, which then I'll lift out of this, that verse. This church is well familiar with Zechariah. Dr. Scott taught through it many, many times. I've referenced and gone through probably in the first year or two of ministry here, uh, went through at least covering the fact that Zechariah had eight visions in one night. I always, every time I go there, I always think, wow, he must have had some good food. Eight visions in one night, or something. He consumed something. <laughs> Please don't read the Bible and say, oh, that's terrible. Put some, put some flesh and blood on these things as you go through them. Otherwise, they become so far removed, you can't even relate to them. Now, God gave these eight visions to Zechariah, and what I love about those eight visions is if carefully read, they are visions to encourage the people. And the call to return, as the people had been carried away in captivity, as prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah, the time had been accomplished. The edict or the decree issued by the heathen king Cyrus to return, which we read about. And if you think about it, the mass multitudes that were carried away and the few that returned, uh, we're talking somewhere between, the, at the low end, some people say 650,000 people were carried away and sometimes upwards of over a million and only 50,000 some returned to the call for the people to come back and rebuild. And I think many times when we have read Zechariah and studied Zechariah and some of you who have been here long enough to remember some of those uh, early messages, uh, early VFs out of Zechariah, the message has always been one of encouragement to God's people when despondency sets in and when workers for God get a little tired. In the case of the people that were called to return to build, we know a little bit of what they faced, what they were up against. We read the the Chronicle, and, you know, when the foundation was laid to rebuild, there was much weeping. Many people cried, thinking, well, this is going to be much smaller than before. And then, of course, when the walls were going up, tears that flowed onto a younger generation who had not seen or beheld the glory of what formerly was there. And I've said many times, people spend a lot of their time looking back at, well, Bruce Springsteen said it good, the glory days. They spend their time looking back at that instead of recognizing that maybe God has a different plan. And sometimes that plan can look different, can sound different, can be different, can be smaller, can take on a different shape. You know, I remember when we began to uh, fix up this place. And, you know, I think some people were upset because uh, we had beautiful purple carpet here. (laughs) Now she's going to take away the beautiful purple carpet that was only here since before the flood. (laughs) And uh, some of those ceiling lights up there, they they were on Noah's Ark. Oh, she's taking away the lights. Okay. But I'm sure that there were a lot of people here, old timers, that in their mind, that was part of the glory of this place, you know, the, 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 the crustiness and the, the, some of the burnt 
uh, stuff on the other lights that were supposed to be ornamental, you know, <laughs> that had melted from, you know, bad, bad choice of bulbs that were too strong that melted the plastic. Oh, please don't touch that. <laughs> but I'm sure that there were some who were maybe depressed a little bit, thinking in spirit that this work will never be what it was back in the day. Just like the people in Zacharias. That's why when I read the scriptures, I never read, and although I'll stay in the context and I read the messages that are there to give us a time frame of those people, there's always something that I can pull out that I apply to us here. I know that there were many people that, upon Dr. Scott's passing, thought the ministry will never be as glorious as it was. Well, they'll never be another Dr. Scott, like they'll never be a Martin, another Martin Luther, another, they'll never be another one of these, another Spurgeon, another Morgan, another Meyer, they'll never be another Melissa Scott, they'll never be another you. Each is so unique and called for a specific thing. We shouldn't look on what was previously and say, well, it can only be that way. So I take from the pages of Zechariah a little bit of encouragement today. And I want to encourage you. There are some who become, oh, we'll call it gloom-filled because they can't see how God's going to carry out certain things. They can't see the way. And in Zechariah's book, and certainly in what was going on here, I love the fact that I'm going to lift out this verse, but there is so much encouragement. If we were just reading in the fourth chapter in what Zechariah is describing and sees and then chronicles for us, the vision of what he sees is so overwhelming. The lampstand and the olive trees, which give me the idea that in our work, in this work, in this time, we're not doing it in our own strength. We're dependent on God's Spirit. In fact, I read a funny quote. I think it was D.L. Moody was once asked by a lady why he kept saying that he needed to constantly be filled by God's Spirit and why he referenced so much of the filling of the Spirit and he turned to the lady and he said, I leak. <laughs> Hey, you got to love it. But <laughs> I want to use that one more often. Because, you know, when we're talking about God's work, a lot of times, and especially these people who are doing, uh, building in the face of contentious opposition, we know that a lot of what they did came to a halt. The people that opposed, they came to ridicule. And they came to basically say, you know those walls that you're building? If a fox climbs up, it'll just come tumbling down. Fools. And there'll always be people looking at, as small as it may appear to those people looking, there may be people that will come and despise even this work and say, well, it's not a mega church. No, this is a pretty big church, actually. See, God does nothing small. I look at the creation and I think to myself, if God made the sparrows the way he did, and they are tiny, but God makes mention of those birds by name, sees the sparrow fall. There's nothing small in God's creation or in his program. There's nothing small to be despised. But the message of encouragement for this church, First for Zachariah's church, and it wasn't a church then just yet, but let's call it that, and the way that we're understanding a people gathered together who belong to God. So from the outside, the opposition, those that ridiculed and tried to weigh down the enthusiasm of those who were there to work, and the ones who were working. And we've got a combination of people that were working inside, working this work. There were those who were the old-timers, They were skilled, they knew what to do, but they still shed the tears because it would never be as glorious. And then there were the young ones that were there and they didn't know anything about the former glory and they just didn't know how this was all going to work out anyway. You've got a whole hodgepodge of people in the mix. See, God has something displayed here in the book and then you lift it up and you say, wow, this is the same thing sitting right in front of me. 
old timers that will still periodically shed a tear and say it'll never be as glorious, young ones that come that have no frame of reference and don't know how the thing's going to work anyway because they don't know how, to, how it goes. How does this spiritual battle work? Is there a battle? What time is it? Oh, where are we? <laughs> and there'll always be the ones on the outside who oppose God's workers and God's plan. Now, I want to keep going back to this verse, and I'll keep repeating it. So when I'm done today, hopefully you're going to leave here, and it'll be in your mind, who hath despised the day of small things? And is there anything small in God's eyes that should be despised? Now, I'm trying to give encouragement today. I'm sure the people during Zechariah's day, as they were building, became depressed, as I said, despondent. Some became afraid. I wish the Apostle Paul was alive back then. Crazy thought. But he could have said to those people in Zechariah's day what he said to Timothy. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He's not given us, literally from the Greek, the spirit of cowardice. I wish that King James would have said it like that, because it's not fear, phobias. The Greek word is cowardice. He's not given us a spirit of cowardice. He's given us a spirit of a sound mind, love. We have clarity on what we're here for. I wish Paul would have been there in that day to tell those people that. We know who brings confusion. We know who is the author of confusion. And if you don't know it yet, I guarantee you, stick around long enough and you will. I mean, in God's plan, not in this ministry, although probably the two go together. Now, why I want to lift this up and why I want to keep going back to this. It's very easy for us to get comfortable after these many years. I'm looking at some of you here who have been here well over 30 years. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and you're still alive. <laughs> you made it. But it's easy to look and say, maybe I don't see with clarity. Some lose their vision. Some lose their affection for God and the things of God. And it's very easy to look on small things and not see the value of what God is doing. You know, we, in nature, we go outside and we see the tiniest bud that will blossom into something great and beautiful, or an acorn that, if untouched by a squirrel or a child's kicking foot, will become an oak. And we don't despise those things at all, but sometimes we despise small things we can't even recognize as God's greatest work in the smallest things. Let me start first. You've got to start with the church, but you can't start with the church unless you start first with Christ. And I'm going to keep, this is my theme today, the question must be asked. I'm lifting this out of Zechariah. I have license to do that in proper context and understanding of what was being said to those people. Who hath despised the day of small things? If I was pondering the question to give you encouragement, and I'm going to make a far journey from the church and Christ all the way to you today, and it's going to seem very detached, but it'll come together. The day of small things, when we refer to Jesus Christ, we say our great Lord and Savior, but the very beginning on earth was a child wrapped in swaddling clothes that only a few came to bow down and worship, understanding that this was definitely something different than any other child born in Israel that day. And probably to an onlooking world, something very small that was despised. See, God's never doing something in a new way. We just, we just have faulty vision most of the time. We can't figure out that God repeats himself. And the pattern in which he does things is always the same. You know, when Jesus was a child and he went into the temple, it says of him just before he went in, in the Chronicle, I think it's in... Luke in the second chapter in the 40th verse where it says that the child grew. He grew in spirit. He waxed strong. He grew in wisdom and knowledge. 
But if you were to look at the Christ child wrapped in swaddling clothes just as a babe, one might say, how could this small thing be savior of such a great big world? And how could a 12-year-old child come in and pit heads with the wisdom of such great scholars in the Jewish frame? So I want you to take from each vignette that I pull from to see God uses these very small things that are really not small at all. They appear small at first. I love the way people often talk about the great saints of the church. Do you ever, when you think of Martin Luther, do you ever think of Martin Luther as he was being nursed on his mother's breast as a great reformer? I don't think so. Or maybe some 200 years later, the brothers, Wesley brothers, starting another kind of uh, change in Christianity called Methodism. I wonder if you think of those just young children, small things. God had planted some seeds in to become great. You know, we're always busy talking about the great saints of the church, but the great saints of the church started all the same way. You know, I think Dr. Scott had his little joke. He used to say that when he was born, he was born with a constitution in one hand and a Bible in the other. <laughs> well, g- good for you, but you came out of the gate the same way. <laughs> you all got to start the same way, I'm sorry to tell you. You might be grabbing on to different things as you go, but you all got to start the same way. We can talk about the great saints of the church To a later time, people like Hudson Taylor, missionary to China, 51 years as a missionary. Think of it, one man going off into this foreign land. How could one man influence? Just think of the land itself. Who hath despised the day of small things? One person making a difference. One person, not one person stoically forging out to brave the storm and saying, I'll bundle up and wear more clothes because it's cold outside, but rather one person, small perhaps in the framework of the land, but great in God's program. And so I I want us to look at this a little closer and don't don't try and jump ahead of me and think, well, I I know where you're going to go because you probably don't. I don't think I even know where I'm going. <laughs> and I've got notes in front of me. I, I just, sometimes I'll look down and I'll go, oh yeah, I should, have, I should have told you that. But it's okay because I've got all the information here. It's like a salad. I may, uh, there may be a few ingredients over here that don't make it in this time around for God's reason. Who knows? But what I want to tell you is you go from Christ and I've given you the picture of Christ as the Christ child, Emmanuel, dressed in, wrapped in swaddling clothes to we look at and move from that small child to all man, all God, Savior of the world. And we move to his disciples, and we say, how could such a movement, as it's sometimes called, sweep the land? Just a few, a handful of men and women who would change the face of the world in less than 100 years, and in 200 years after that time that Christianity would be accepted and not despised, a small thing now becoming a spreading flame taking over the whole world. Who hath despised the day of small things? If you look at everything in its proper perspective, you begin to see that even these people who were building, they could not see what great ramifications their efforts and work would bring, what type of fruit would come of what seemed to be such a small, in the eyes of the elders, insignificant work. Now, you keep moving through this, and then you get to yourself, because here's where I want to stay a little while. I'm moving pretty quickly. When we talk about people in the church, and this is, it seems... Uh, kind of a generic message, but now we'll come down to the specifics. I still remember people saying, what is she going to say? You see, she's such a young believer. What's she going to say? 
Why do you think that people despise you know, when they see a young person stand up and make a declaration about the Lord. I'm not saying just testify. I've heard young people get up and preach. Why do some despise this? Because this is what happens as we, as we progress. We forget that we too were babes once. We were small in our understanding, limited in our, in our knowledge of God's Word. It's only the person who says, they know all they need to know about God. You can tell how little they know about God and they're standing before him when they make those kinds of utterances. But I remember people speaking of me saying, what on earth is she going to say? I've been here 20 plus years. I've been here 25 years. You know, some, some wanted to pit heads with me. And I came to you from day one kind of fumbling around, and I did. I fumbled around plenty of times in front of you, knowing God had to do something for me, even if I possessed wisdom, and if it was earthly wisdom and understanding, it, it wouldn't help in God's work because only God's wisdom, God's ways, God's knowledge, His Word could be the method to stand before you. Every single Sunday has been proof of that. I come to you and I think to myself, now look back at those people who looked on me. Who hath despised the day of small things? I'm, I guarantee you when you leave here, you're going to remember that verse. You're going to remember the fact that out of this mouth, which no one had really heard speak, just but a few words here and there, I think, one time on festival, Dr. Scott had me sit down. Another time, right here on this previous platform, for just a few words. Now, the staff people had heard me speak to them before. And I'm not sure that I was speaking to them. I think I might have been yelling at them. <laughs> but you had never heard me speak. And some despise that. And I say caution. Caution to you. First of all, we're told not to judge. You might say, where, where's this going? I'll get there. Don't despise the small things because a lot of times it's in those small things that you see the bigger picture. If you're able to see with the vision that Christ gives, you're able to see the bigger picture. We can talk about the day of small things, and I, I then begin to recognize that I could travel down those who are always looking at what is outside of themselves. They despise, I've had this conversation, they despise anything that is not of their doing in their realm regarding the ministry. They'll look at any, else, any other's ministry and say, well, that can't be a very big ministry or a very good ministry. And, you know, I, I've had to do some soul searching on this. I think that the most important thing is that not all ministers of God, not all are going to reach. There are some ministries, we'll call them more street ministers, and they go out and they're in the streets and they're ministering to people out there. And probably if I stepped out on the street, the very people that are listening to that one who maybe it's five, six, ten, or twenty, they wouldn't listen to me. And then there are other ministers to do and bring other people who will listen and hear. It's not, look, I am the formula and everyone should be just like me. It's a caution to you as a congregation because I've had to do the same thing. I've had to check myself. God will use different methods in different ways. He's using all the same thing. It must come from this. From his word, from his spirit, it must be that, that beginning point, which seems sometimes rather small. You come into the church. I've heard people say, well, if I don't feel it, I'm not staying. I can make you feel it. <laughs> you know, I have to feel all the energy. I'm going to make you feel it. <laughs> now, some of you are not sure what I'm talking about because I'm sure I could whoop some of you into a frenzy and others of you I could probably reduce you down to a wet spot on the floor. I'm not talking about that type of feeling. 
thank God. <laughs> what I'm trying to get at is a lot of times people come into the church and their idea of what they should receive when they come in is so warped by the grandeur of other things that are not the church that when they come in, they're expecting, as I've said, they're expecting Niagara Falls to pour out on them rather than perhaps receive what I'll call a little bit of the dew of God's grace. And you know that little bit of dew that I'm calling God's grace becomes very large depending on your perspective. If you have a right view of yourself, you say, I don't deserve... And then you say, just like the scriptures, his grace is sufficient. It's enough. I think a lot of times people expect such gargantuan things of the church. They cannot see the smallest things, and they actually despise the smallest things. I used to spend hours through the week preparing for Sunday in different languages, which... A lot of people said, well, why don't you do that anymore? Well, we're studying Hebrew for the ones who wanted to sign up, and I still actually do a lot of language work for myself from the scriptures. But I recognize something. There are way too many people that were coming into the church tantalized by what appeared to be great understanding and language, and they were despising the little things. They didn't want to hear the simple and forgive me for saying this, small things of God which perhaps when taken into the heart are the greatest things you can receive. How, tell me, how do you expect, now I'm speaking to you from my heart, how do you expect me to stand, because I do believe I'll stand and give account, and say, was I more concerned for you to be tantalized and drawn by something that appears so odd? by my knowledge, which I gained in languages or in history? Or would I prefer you to take some of the simpler things that actually, if they take root, it's just what Jesus said about the mustard seed, relating that to the kingdom of heaven, that once it takes root, becomes the mightiest, grows like crazy, and even the birds come and take refuge in it. I prefer that if I have to choose between these things. That's why I said there is a message to you, the church. Don't think this is just something out there. Now, the small things that people despise may be outside of themselves. We're always quick, by the way. We are the quintessential experts on the beam and moat factor when it's somebody else's beam and moat. But be it far from us to see that we're, we are. We, we tend to do this a lot, you know. Highly critical of what somebody else ought to be doing, never stopping long enough to see we're probably way worse. Now, the beginnings, these small beginnings I'm talking about, outside of yourselves, other ministries. People say, do you, I like the word uh, in this, do you partner with other ministries? We do a lot with a lot of people. And some people we help are individuals and some are large entities. That's nobody's business. That's between me and God with what what we do. But when people say, oh, I just have a small ministry, I just want to grab them and say, no, it's not small. It's actually very big. It's a very big thing that God would entrust you to speak to one soul. Forget about the megachurches. I always say this to you. If you haven't figured this out already, how can one person standing on a platform in front of a mass multitude of people look into the crowd and say, that face over there that I've known and seen for 15, 18, 19 years, whatever it's been, I know this person's family. I know what they're going through. I know this one over here and that husband and wife back there and these over here and the people that write letters in the mail, which I read all the time. How can you keep your hand on that? Somebody said, well, you have time to do these things? This is what I live for. Well, who wants to read letters? I do. 
Who wants to read about somebody's three-line prayer request when we could be pharisaical and read an epistle of all the issues of world problems we're solving? You see what I'm saying? It's the idea that there's nothing. When it comes to God's work, there is nothing small. There's a passage in Ezekiel that speaks of the bulls of Bashan, who, those strong ones who would push and overpower the weak ones. And God says he'll pronounce judgment on those. We ought to give a little caution of how we perceive the small things because they're definitely not small. Now that's outside of our field. But what about inside? I touched on the grace of God because there are still people that come into the church who still maybe frustrate the grace of God. They, they don't think it's enough. That God's grace is not enough. I need to have a complete bathing, catheterized, whitewashing, dunking, full orbed everything. Hold me under a little while longer so I can make sure that I'm actually washed and cleansed. Experience. Rather than being satisfied that the measure of grace that God gives is sufficient. It may appear small to you, but let me ask you this. Compare yourself like this, like a mother nursing a child. child is small and the mother does not despise the size of the child or its complete dependency on the mother's breast. And this is the issue that I want us to focus on it is that we should never despise the small things. You know, when I hear people tell me of somebody sick and they're maybe not making the recovery, they've been fasting for this person and praying, and they're not making the recovery they ought to, they think in their mind. Don't despise the day of small things. You know, the day when you see the person who's been laying in bed sick with just a little bit of a smile or a little light in the eyes. Don't despise that. Don't say, well, it's not exactly what I want it to be. Grab hold of that and be thankful for even that. That's the smallest, if it's the smallest thing that God could give you or that person, grab hold of it. I remember, I've told you the story, I remember sitting by Dr. Scott's bedside and he had already fallen into a coma or so they said, and it was myself. I think, I'm not sure that you were there, Brad. I'm not sure which, which person, if it was you or Mick, that was there. We traded off places, or you traded off places. But I was with a nurse that had come in to stay as a 24-hour presence in the hospital. And they said, oh, he's in a coma. He can't hear you. When I was leaning over his bed and had his hand, and I watched because he had one eye closed and one eye open, and he had, I remember telling you this, his eyebrows were furrowed, and I remember watching, he had tears coming out of the open eye. And I remember saying to him, you know, Gene Scott, I know you can hear me in there, so I don't want you to get upset, I don't want you to try and talk because I, I know him. Don't, don't try and talk. But if you can hear me right now, not at any other time, I want you to grab my hand. and I want you to squeeze it real hard twice so I know that you really heard me. And I was we- wearing my wedding band and a ring. He had squeezed my hand so hard two times that the, the stones in my ring had actually almost cut into the flesh. And I kind of moved away, and I thought, this darn doctor's telling me he can't hear me, and he can't. So, of course, a doctor came in and says, no, no, lady, listen. People in comas, they have these things all the time. <laughs> well, the nurse came over, and the nurse was a very sweet lady, and she came over, and she's calling Dr. Scott precious and darling, and I'm thinking, this is going to go far with him. <laughs> and she leans over, and she says, okay, Darling, if you can hear me, grab, grab my hand and squeeze it. And he wouldn't squeeze her hand. And I was thinking, see? See what I'm saying? 
I didn't despise that smallest act was as if God was saying, and I didn't know it because I believed God was going to raise him up from a coma, but it was as if God was saying to me at that time, don't despise the small things. Take them. They come from my hand. It may appear to be a crumb to you, but take it. I remember, of course, typical me. I had to go back just to make sure a second time. Of course, when I was talking to him, what was so remarkable is that they told me he can't hear you, he can't understand you. Of course, he did it again, only this time when he was holding my hand, I noticed that the tears were coming out of his eye much quicker. And I thought to myself, not only can he hear me, but I knew he was trying to communicate with me. He was, he was in there somewhere, still fighting and still duking it out in faith. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I've said to you many times as a congregation, I've seen many things. I saw many miracles with that man in the last few months. But this one, it was as if God was saying, don't get despondent. Don't get discouraged. This may be a small thing that you see, but for me it was very great. I'm trying to say that to you today. Don't despise the day of small things. If you're sick today, and even if you feel just a little bit better, I want you to remember this scripture. When you wake up in the morning, some of you woke up and you don't have any sickness, and you can't even figure out that God woke you up this morning, opened your eyeballs, gave you breath in your lungs, got your feet to actually go in the right direction, and got you here safely. You know, I think... Not only is this a message to encourage those who may be feeling like God is not pouring out the Niagara Falls blessings, but it's also a reminder to not be ungrateful to what God has already given. It's easy to do that. When people tell me about somebody in their family who has a dependency issue, whether it's alcohol or drugs, and I don't take this lightly because I've been around enough people who struggle with substance. I know, it, I know how cruel it is. If we're just going to talk about alcoholism, alcohol is a very cruel master. Alcohol comes usually as a happy face at first, arms open, ready to receive you. Jack Daniels is always happy. <laughs> But after a while, when you become dependent, so I'm not against alcohol. I, I tell people that people say, are you for or against? I don't tell people if you drink, you're going to hell. But I do know that there are certain people that it's in their DNA, it's in their frame to be addicted. And once that, once that gets a grip, it's almost like you've been locked into something and you're in a prison, you're in bondage. And I love what Paul says in Romans 8 when he says that God has not given us the spirit of bondage, but the spirit of adoption, literally in the Greek, the spirit of sonship. So maybe you woke up today and you said, today I'm not going to drink. Just today. Don't despise the day of small things just the simple utterance of a person who has become dependent to say, I'm an alcoholic, is huge. It's, it's analogous, if you will, to, to Jacob being confronted with the angel and wrestling all night and being forced to say what he is. I'm heel catcher. For the first time in my life, I'm heel catcher. Don't despise the day of small things. They're not small in God's sight. They may be small to the people around you who don't understand. It's the mother whose son or daughter has finally come home. And you might think, well, there's still a big battle ahead because we don't know how to sort the matter out after the mess of a child running away. Don't despise the day of small things because it was a large thing that the father watched over this wandering child of yours. And why would we think God would be any different? In the book of Isaiah, and in other prophecies, it is described, Christ is described as taking the lambs into his bosom and carrying them. That means he hears their bleating 
and he hears their heart beating, and he knows exactly where they have wandered off, is it something to be despised? Now, there are people out there who what I'm saying to you right now as a congregation would say, well, why talk about this to the church? Go tell it to the lost people out there. Because there are lost people standing and sitting right in front of me today. Some who don't have the courage even. You know how much shame goes with some of the things that I've said? Failure is the biggest thing. We're so worried about the greatness of our failure. But maybe today you recognize, yeah, my failure is real great, but God's, God's grace is beginning to work on me. I just feel a little bit of the dew, and it's enough. Now, if you've even come to not despise the day of small things, and let me just say that this one thing to add to this. Satan, by the way, he doesn't despise the day of small things either people that come into the church, and this is important for you who are just coming into the church. No one likes to talk about this. Every, oh, I'd like to use a colloquial word, and it's probably not not a good one, but every evangelist out there (laughs) wants to tell you about the happy life of the Christian. I see more people come into the church. They're not prepared for battle. They're not prepared for what's going to happen to them as a Christian, as a new Christian. And Satan does not despise the day of small things. You say, explain this to me. Oh, if you think that God's grace is small in your life, a small operation, Satan understands that all too well. He sees when people have begun to follow the conviction of sin by way of the Holy Spirit, when prayer has begun to operate and gravitating towards the Word of God, Don't believe me? Go read the parable of the sower in Mark's gospel where it says, and for those where the seed was planted, small seed, being sown, rather, then Satan comes. I wish every single evangelist would read that passage. And then Satan comes. I'll read it to you. You don't turn there because I'll be gone before you get there. The sower, soweth the, the sower soweth the word, which is the seed, the word. These are they by the wayside when the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, take away the word which was sown in their hearts. Satan doesn't despise the day of small things because he recognizes the day of small things is just a little word, small. And he can manage to get you away from that. Here comes trouble. And if Satan can't do that work right there, then he comes to whisper at you in your ear, if you'll listen, that your past is not really past or that your present can't really be or maybe you cannot have a future. You can't see it. Let me tell you, if you could foretell your own future, first of all, I don't think you'd want to know it, and second of all, you would alter the course of what exactly God deigns to do, which may appear small in your eyes at this moment, but you don't know what greatness God has in store for you. The message today is to encourage those people who are stumbling around, thinking, we've all done this before. God's not doing too much. Yeah, God's out there rescuing other people and saving other people and healing other people. I did this a few weeks ago. Remember, I came to you last week and I was talking about my struggles, but a few weeks ago, one of my staff people just, I kind of let it all out there, and it was kind of ugly. I'm not talking about the staff person. (laughs) It was kind of ugly because that's why I said no one's immune to this. You can be a pillar of faith. The minute you stop praying, the minute you... Let go of the word. And even if you've got all of this going on in your life, Satan is very wise. He doesn't despise the small things. Your vision suddenly gets clouded, and you cannot see even the smallest of God's blessings and operation in your life. And I was busy lamenting that. I said, no, God's busy doing things elsewhere. But I've been saying God is my help 
in this present trouble that I'm in, and he has not presented himself into my trouble yet. <laughs> we're kind of sick, you know, we think we'll just open our mouth and whoosh, uh, God is like Flo from the insurance company, just <laughs> appears. But don't despise the day of small things, even if you don't feel God is doing what you've asked and prayed for, the very fact that you are still talking to God, see that as a large thing. Because the day you stop talking to God, the day the communion is shut off and the door is closed, it's your responsibility to talk to Him. Now, I've talked about outside of ourselves, inwardly. I've talked about Satan, who's brilliant at not despising the small things. He's always trying to figure out how to get the believers, maybe even to despise the small things. And I want to just, I want to take this all into one place and bring it all together. See, if the people in Zachariah's day could look at what they were doing, the importance, by the way, of the few who could respond to God's call. See, this is the encouragement for me. I recognize that out of so many thousands of people carried away, very few even cared about God's work enough to return. And even fewer in that lot even cared enough to have the resilient faith and the tenacity to keep going in spite of opposition and ridicule. Look at yourselves today. As I've said to you, we're rebuilding and we're working and we're doing a work. Look at yourselves today and ask if you don't see the same thing. Don't despise they may be small opportunities that God gives you. Don't pass them by. When I say opportunities, I'm talking about the opportunity of faith. Don't pass it by. Have you ever done that? You've passed, you know you've passed by an opportunity for faith, and then you've thought about it the rest of the day. You ever done that? I've done that. I'm honest enough to tell you I've done that. And I've thought about it the whole day long. Gosh, I really should have, you know, I should have done that. I should have attacked that one. I should have, you know, I should have... And there's all these picture, all of these should-haves floating in the air somewhere. And by the time you're done at the end of the day, you're basically just trying to get up over the should-haves. Wow, say that five times real quick. <laughs> but I'm looking at these people who needed the encouragement and they got the job done. And I'm looking at some of you today and I'm saying the same thing. This may appear in the sight of some to be a small work. Some may say, well, as opposed to somebody else's work. But you were brought for this work. You and I were brought here for this specific time. There is no small thing in God's program. And when I look at the whole concept that I've unfolded today, I think to myself, you know, if I would just be able sometimes to change my focus meter, the focus meter get so wrapped up on looking at the foundation and the walls and are the, are the walls going to be high enough or are they going to be resilient enough or we, I could keep going, but rather the very fact that God would give me a trowel and a sword and say, here, kid, go to work, means he must see, even if it's the smallest bit, he knows I'm able. And the same thing for you. Don't despise the day of small things. I come back to this over and over again because when, I, when you leave here, I want you to say inside your head, there's nothing small in God's program. There's nothing small about waking up this morning and saying or leaving here today and saying a little step in the right direction. It may not be the biggest one I've ever taken, but it's, it's a small step and I'm not going to despise it. Maybe some listening for the first time who are expecting me to do what every other person does, which is do an altar call so you can step forward and make a public declaration. No. The small step is occurring while God's Spirit is quickening you. While I'm speaking, yeah, I've had a spirit of being not truly grateful for even the small things and haven't even recognized all the greatness of what God has been doing in my life. Maybe you are so old in God's program that you think, oh, 
I'm disenthralled with the whole matter. I feel like uh, I'm not even a smoldering flax. I'm just kind of stinky because I've been around for so long. Don't despise the day of small things. Don't despise the day of small things. Progress in the, in the Christian realm is not made. You're not going to become some giant of the faith overnight. I love the story of Tozer. It took him 10 years before he would write his first book. And if you've ever read A.W. Tozer's work, you know that there was some really good stuff that he put down in paper. Some might say, well, why didn't he do that earlier? Why did he wait 10 years? He said he wasn't ready. But when the time was right, there was nothing small about what that man wrote. We could say the same thing about many of these people. But how did they start? Small. And God knows there's nothing small about his work. I hope you leave here with this scripture on your mind and your tongue. The next thing that comes your way, whether it's someone in your family, a friend, whatever battles you're facing that you don't despise, even the smallest of things. I remember Dr. Scott using the, the expression, God, show me, just show me a little bit of the wagon wheels. Well, he did. And I'm telling you the same thing in the same way to look on even the smallest things and say, God, great God, omnipotent God, omniscient God, still sees even the smallest of his creation, the smallest of his work, what appears to be insignificant to others is very great in his eyes. Don't forget it. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.